Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I would like to take a moment and say welcome and thank you for being here. If you would like to know more of what's going on here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning more about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways, whether you visit our physical location, give online, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. This morning to Luke chapter 13. It's Labor Day. I don't want to ruin your picnic. Don't want to rain on your parade. I want to encourage you today. What are we working for? Luke chapter 13. And look at verse 24, please. He replied. Now, because the words that follow are in red in most of your Bibles, my Bible, your, probably your Bible as well, unless you have one of the ones that does not have the words of Jesus Christ in red. He, obviously, is the Lord Jesus because he says, Work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will try to enter, but will fail. Wow. Now, the Greek word here for work, and I'm not good at Greek, that's why I don't speak it. We need Sister Sherry up here to help us, but is the word from which we get agonize. And literally, it is agonizome. I put it, if you have access to our notes, my notes for today, I listed it there for you. That's the Greek spelling you can see in that agonize. Jesus said, agonize to get into this small door that has all kinds of restrictions around it. Those restrictions are the pressures of life, the obstacles and challenges that you face when you look at somebody else who seems to be getting everything and it's easy and they never have a problem. And here you are struggling because that's all part of the frame of the door. Those are the doorposts. And that's why you can't go through there unless the blood is on those doorposts. Because all of that, the doorposts of this door are alive. They represent life. And for you to get through there, you've got to do it with the power and presence of God. There's no other way to make it through. None. There aren't seven ways. There aren't other religions that have the way. All of them talk about some sort of door, some sort of paradise, heaven, whatever it might be, but they don't have a way to get through the door because Jesus Christ said, I am the door. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's coming soon. So what do we do? Well, the definition of that Greek word is to struggle, to labor, to fervently strive. Well, pastor, I hear all the time this grace that Jesus loves me no matter what. God loves me in spite no matter what I do, what I've done, what I'll ever do. It's just love, grace, love, grace. I don't have to worry about anything. I know. I get it. I hear that all the time. I see that theology, but I'm just reading from red. That's all. Work hard. Well, that was before the cross, Pastor. And what Jesus was saying was that up until the cross, there was a lot of work that had to take. But once the cross came, there's absolutely no work. He, he doesn't want me to do anything. He doesn't want me to strive. He doesn't want me to agonize because that makes me feel bad. And I don't like it when I feel bad, and he doesn't either. Okay, so I'm trying to find the verse where Jesus says, Now, everything I said prior to dying on the cross is invalid. And I keep looking. When you find it, tell me, okay? This is him talking to us because he understands how easy it is to press into that doorway to be going through and then say, oh, squirrel. <laughs> look, look, look at the bright lights. Look at the money. Oh, if I just had more Bitcoin, I think I'll go get Bitcoin. And then God will be very happy with me because I'll give much. We have to be very careful because Jesus is clear. He's not mixing words. He's not somehow compromising. He's not trying to trick us. He's trying to share with us that there are certain realities about coming into eternal life, about faith. And those realities don't change. And this world is not of God. And there's nothing in this world. Do we need things? Yes, I get it. We need things. We need a lot less things than what we have here in America. There's a guy in the Bible that said, I know what I'll do with all my things. I 
will buy more buildings and build bigger buildings because I have many, many things. Now, I don't think he was shown in a real positive light. Maybe you have a different interpretation of that. But I think Jesus said, you fool. This very night, your soul. Now, I don't think this was a guy that was just fabricated in the mind of Jesus. I don't believe that's the case of anybody of any of the parables Jesus talked about or told. You may disagree with me, but I think every one of them, though unnamed, represents somebody that some people in the crowd knew. So the next morning when they get up and we're looking at the paper and they saw the obituary of this really rich guy who had a building project going on and was building barn number three, that they said, oh, oh, guess what? He had to stand before God last night and explain why he was wanting more stuff. Anyways, that was free. Just an extra. Go, to your, go in your Bible to, go to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. What, do we, what are we working for? I, I, I love Labor Day. All of us love a picnic and a three-day vacation weekend, right? Romans chapter 12. And let's look today at what we're working for biblically. Let's, let's get a biblical perspective of this. We respect Labor Day. We're appreciative of it this coming this coming weekend is um, 9-11. You know, one of the things that is big on our calendar, and it just happens to coincide with 9-11, is Muddy Buddy. If you're not signed up for Muddy Buddy, it's this Saturday night at 6 o'clock. There's going to be cotton candy, popcorn. Pastor is cooking hot dogs, and Sister Pam's making chili. And it's open to everybody. If your kids want to run through the mud and then get chalk thrown all over them, color color chalk, they need to sign up at muddybuddy.run. Is that right? Did I say it right? Muddybuddy.run. Because that's a website. But you need to sign your kids up, and they need to come and run because this raises money for missions. Hallelujah. Amen. You don't need to build another barn. Sell what you've got. Give... See how I did that? Right in the middle of the message, just wove that right in. Got you excited about giving. Listen, there there are kids who, Miss Sonia this morning is giving them money towards several kids have been sponsored by people here in the church. They've already raised their $100. That's their goal. The next day in church, next Sunday, they're going to have the day of big giving. And all of that is about back in kids' church, and it's all about, or up in kids' church, all about giving. And uh, seeing how God can use them to touch the nations of the world. Amen? So Muddy Buddy is this coming Saturday night. You all, all of us should be there. It, it's just cool to watch the kids, to clap for them as they come across. Starts at 6, it's over at about 6.10. Because they run that lap like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> for, you can bring your 4-year-old and they'll have a great time. You can bring your 94-year-old. They might like it and they might not, but... <laughs> Saturday night, 6 o'clock, up at the pavilion. You come in at 5, 5.30, and we're just going to be in there having a good time. Uh, Hot dogs, chili, and who knows what all the Lord will have us do. Okay, you're in Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 11. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Number one, we work for profit. Now, I, I don't know what you're thinking about that this morning, but we do. That's why we work, amen, so that we can profit. Now, I'm saying this or using this verse because I felt the Lord lead me to it, but also because we're in this time when a lot of people have been um, enticed by the government to not work. Now, I don't know that personally. I've just read stories in the newspaper and and things like that. But the government understood that there was an issue over the last year and a half or so, and they decided to do what government always does. They just throw a bunch of money at it, or paper money, made up money. And in doing that, I think people might have lost the idea of what's going on here. In this life, the Bible says that it's God's will for us to work, never to be lazy, but to work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Now you might say, well, pastor, I I get it. You know, for you who are in ministry, 
he's talking to you. No, he's talking to people in secular employment. And he's telling you and I, you, to do it with everything. You don't believe me? Ephesians 4.28 says, If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. See, we work for profit, but we take the profit and we share it. How many of you have heard over the last 483 years, people in culture and government always saying there needs to be a law that makes people with money share it with people who don't have money? And the ones saying that are always putting themselves in the category of not having money. And they believe that people who have a lot of money should share with them. Right? Now this has become such a powerful part of the world's makeup and mindset that there are even ideologies that are geared towards this. Communism, socialism, for example. But the Bible is teaching you and I that we work for profit so that we don't need laws to give, but so that we are, by the Spirit of God, led to give. It comes because God lives in us, and this is why the world can't do it. They try. They say, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to pass this law. And we're going to have a better tax, and it never, never happens, right? We're not worried about the world. Colossians 3.23 says it this way, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. You should see right there that he's talking about the secular workplace. So Ephesians 4.28, Colossians 3.23, 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 to 12, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business. Now listen, posting on social media can also qualify as not living a quiet life. There's a place for posting, there's a place for engaging people, and there's a, an amount, but you need to ask the Lord what your limit is. I don't know it. I don't even care. But what I'm saying is this isn't just about verbal communication. It can also be written. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business, and working with your hands just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not Christians, uh-oh, Ooh. then people who are not Christians will respect the way you live and you will not need to depend on others. Now, you know that's been a part of the fabric of the American culture for several hundred years. The idea that we want to work and our economy is about providing so that everybody benefits. Now, I'm not saying it's worked that way, but that was the Christian influence back in the day. Right? Right? I mean, it's obvious. You can see that. That kind of leadership, that kind of guidance scripturally has been instilled in us, or at least it was as a culture, for a couple of hundred years. There were even denominations like the Presbyterians that really, really focused on how they work. The Mennonites, right? They focus on drawing people to their lifestyle because of how they run their businesses and how they work. And that kind of witness is biblical. It's important. And so Paul says, the Holy Spirit says, make it your goal to live a quiet life, mind your business, and work with your hands. Then people who aren't even believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. 2 Thessalonians 3. Boy, this is, Paul just gets on this, doesn't he? Even while we were with you, we gave you this command, those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. Sounds to me like in his first letter he told them what to do, and in the second letter he found out they weren't doing it. He said, yet we hear. When Paul says we, who do you think he means? <laughs> he means him, right? Him and the Lord. Hey, we've heard this. We know what's going on over there. And uh, we command such people. And urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. As to the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Number one, we work for profit so that we can do the things I've read to you. To give generously, to work unto the Lord, to gain respect, and to survive. If you're going to eat, the Bible says you've got to work. Now, there, listen. I'll get emails, text messages, and people personally in my personal space at the picnic all through this week, and they'll be saying, but pastor, 
you said that and you don't understand. Well, I do understand, okay? When I'm up here preaching, I'm telling you what the Word says. What I'm telling you is this is God's Word. You might be in a place where things are different. If you've retired, hallelujah, God bless you. You worked. Praise God, right? And some of you are retired and you say, well, I do more now than I did. And glory to God. But listen, this isn't about you making sure that you were working a 12-hour shift the day you keeled over. That's not what the Holy Spirit's saying, okay? Come on. I know you're literalists here. You're, you're Germans and everything's literal, black and white, no in between, nothing. But you, do, you get the, do you get the spirit of what God's saying here? Do you understand that he's pulling us into a place where we're not working to, to just be productive citizens? We're not working because we're communists or socialists. We're not working because we're, uh, um, um, what, what's our way, our, uh, your, um, Capitalists, thank you. We're working because, number one, we're doing it under the Lord. But number two, he's doing stuff in us because we're working. It's, it's about interacting with people there at work. It's about learning interpersonal connections and relationships. It's about learning how to say, I'm sorry, how to say, whoa, wait, this is not working for you. You're not taking care of me. It's about all of that. It's about having to pray for things. You need a better job? Pray. You need a job? Pray. God wants... That's his word. You can take it and you can stand on and say, God, I'm standing on your word because you promised me that if I serve you and seek you, you'll give me a job. You want me to, this is your will for my life that I would work. I'm here and ready to go. Amen. If you're incapacitated, you're on disability, you're what, I, I, listen, there's no issue with that, with the Bible. That, that's, you get it. He's, what he's talking about is the spirit of what he wants. You, if you're in a situation where you literally can't work, that, thank God that America had that in our fabric at one time too, where we were doing everything in our power to take care of those among us who could not. That's why people from every other nation in the world would do anything to get here. I'm not here to comment on how the government handles all that. I don't care. It's difficult at times. It doesn't work like it should. I know all of that. But what I'm saying to you is that we work for profit so that we can give generously. That's just who we are. It is. We love to. <laughs> Pastor, you're getting a little carried away there today. You got all that end time stuff going on in your head and you're really getting carried away. I know I have to give, and sometimes I'm a little bit behind on my giving, but this thing about loving giving, no, we do because we love the Lord, and we love obeying his word. And he said, listen, you got to work so you can profit, so you can give generously. Are there other reasons why I need to give, put into my 401k, and I need to buy a new bike for my grandchild, and I need to go on vacation, oh, all that. But number one, we work so that we can profit, so that we can give generously. That's our passion. That's our aim, our goal. That's our motivation in how we work. If you need to go in and say to the boss, I need a raise so I can give more generously, you have at it. If you have three employees that attend here at church and they come in tomorrow or Tuesday and say, we need raises so we can, pastor said we got to give more generously. Here's the second thing. Go to Hebrews chapter four, uh, 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Who took he there it is. It was gone there for a minute. Hebrews 12, look at verse 14. Work at living in peace with everyone, and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. We quote that part all the time. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. But there's a phrase before it that says, work at peace. I don't know too many believers who are really hanging out in this neighborhood. I don't know too many American believers who understand what value God places on this. As a matter of fact, I run into believers all the time that in their communication, in their conversation, they are actually contradicting the New Testament mandate. Pastor, this is an obscure verse in Hebrews written by a woman. And you know how it is. Can you tell that God in me? 
Uh, Sister Sherry lowered the boom on us back in February, and I've been struggling with that ever since. Well, let's, um, let's take a moment here and understand. Number two today, we work for peace. We work for peace. That's what the Bible says. We're called to do that. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. There's that confirmation with the holiness part of Hebrews. Let us work toward, let us work toward complete holiness. So if you think that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ means you don't have to do anything after you're saved, that you've got no responsibility, you can live any old which way you want, then you're going to find yourself living with witches. If you want to live every which way, that's what you're going to get. But if you want to live according to the plan for Jesus Christ, you're going to work towards holiness. And peace. First Peter 3.11. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. Search for peace and work to maintain it. Matthew 5.9. If you look there, you can write these down. I don't have them in your notes. But you can look at these references later. This one will be in red, meaning Paul didn't say it. James, Peter, John. We, we love all those writings. Priscilla didn't even say it. This is... The Lord Jesus Christ. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Oh, you're being very quiet. Methinks that you might be concerned that I'm setting you up. Methinks you're right. The Bible is clear. We work for profit so that we can give generously. Nobody wants to work and not earn anything, right? You got to pay your bills and you got, but so that we can give generously. But the second thing we do as believers is we work for peace. Now I'm going to tell you something these last days. This is God's call to the church that we have to work for peace no matter where we live on the planet, no matter where, no matter what culture, what country. So I'm about to ask you something. You know what's coming. Do you feel that you work for peace here in America? No, I'm not talking about in Afghanistan. Iraq, I'm not talking about places where the military has been. I'm talking about right here in our country is the church recognized, the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. Are we recognized as working for peace? Brother Dave, do you mind coming and sharing the testimony of what happened to you this week that you shared with me the other day? As uh, Brother Dave was on his way, I've read about some of the young ladies, sports young ladies in the last couple of weeks, Simone Biles, and I forget who I was reading about last night, but they shared some of the things that people text them or put on their Facebook page. Just vicious towards these girls, trying to rip them to pieces emotionally, speaking disparagingly of them racially. But that's not just there. This is here. Praise God. Uh, I went to the post office the other day, and as I was coming out to the post office, getting ready to get in my car, I seen a, a, a guy riding a bicycle coming from around, I don't know if he's come from the Union Mission or he's coming from around that way. But the thing is, uh, he looked over to me and said, what you looking at, nigger? And he threw up the Hitler sign. And I don't care who you are in Christ, how long you've been in Christ, what your relationship with God, there's still something inside of us that riles up. You understand? We have an anger, a sinful nature that's in us. It never goes nowhere until we get to be with the Lord. Amen? And my flesh rose up just a bit. You understand what I'm saying? And he, he had one of the motorized bicycles, and he rolled down, you know what I mean, towards Martin's. And I was going to Martin's. I wanted to be there. Oh, I wanted to be there. So when I got to Martin's, I seen his bike outside of Martin's. And now I have to get into a different mode right now. You hear what I'm saying? I'm going to have to ask the Lord to give me some strength. (laughs) 
because when I got there and I seen him inside the store, I just walked up to him. I said, man, let me tell you something. I said, I've been locked up for 20 years, you know what I mean, in my life, and I've never had anyone disrespect me. Even when I was working for the devil, I had nobody disrespect me like the way you disrespect me. Well, he, you know what he said? Well, man, I was locked up longer than you. <laughs> really? And that's all you learned in there? <laughs> but what I told him, I said, look, you're heading back in that direction. For one thing that I know, you understand, I'm saved. Right. And I have something working inside of me that won't let me choke you out right now. <laughs> Amen? Yeah, amen. That's what we have. We have the Holy Spirit that keeps us, I mean, from retaliating the way our flesh wants us to retaliate. So I let him know that. I said, look, man, I said, you're hitting back in that direction or death because you're going to run across somebody that's not saved and they're not going to have something to restrain them from doing what, you, what they want to do. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm just, I'm telling you all today, you know, this like Pastor saying, these are the last days. Do you hear what I'm saying? We can't look past that. We know that Jesus is coming soon. But what I understand that Satan is trying to devour everyone that he can devour. You understand what I'm saying? He's trying to take everybody out of here he can take because he knows his time is short. So we have to be vigilant. We have to be sober. We have to be uh, uh, like-minded with one another as Christians. We got to pray for one another that somebody else may get into that same situation. You know what I'm saying? It's not gone anyway. And it was sad. You know, it really hurt my heart. But I was angry. I'm telling you, I was, I was like a volcano at the particular time when he said it. But I thank God. I thank God for his grace and I thank God for his mercy. And I thank the Holy Spirit for just working inside of me. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Amen. Perfect. Now, he didn't know I was going to ask him to do that, but I knew I could put him on the spot and he'd be fine. I didn't know how he was going to share that, but I'm, I'm glad he did. Just straight out. You who are my majority racially, do you know what it means to work for peace? It means to confront that stuff right there. Come on, if Jesus were here, if Jesus were here. And I tell you this every once in a while, but you, many of you have never experienced what it's like to be somewhere as a racial minority, where you are in the kind of situation that Brother Dave lives in every day. I've been there many times, and suddenly I learned two things. I depend on my brothers and sisters in Christ. If they're not defending me, I've been in situations where I'd have been beaten or killed. Had it not been for those who love Jesus and are full of the Holy Spirit being right there with me. Because the people in the place that I was going, they didn't care about me. Didn't want anything to do with me. Because of who I was linguistically, I didn't speak their language. Who I was racially, I didn't look like them. They didn't care about me spiritually. I didn't serve the same God they served. In every way possible, they summarize it this way. I see your blue eyes. And that's an incredibly disparaging feeling to realize that somebody's got that kind of hatred. On a side note, I, the guy must have been far enough away he couldn't see how big Brother David is. I mean, holy smokes, what are you thinking? I don't care if there's a battery on your bicycle as big as this church. You are not going to outrun him. And when he gets a hold of you, whoo. We've got to work for peace. I'm telling you, in the last days that Jesus Christ is looking for people in his church who are working for peace. I read a story yesterday that there was a guy in line at the gas pump in uh, Louisiana, in Bat uh, not Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and there, a, a fight broke out, and the one went back to his car and got a gun and came and shot the other one and killed him. And the sheriff was talking about how heartbroken he was. I, I don't know racially about any of it, but here's what the people pumping gas kept pumping gas. Nobody, because they've been waiting for days and days. They're in a line that's a mile long, you know? So they're like, listen, 
I'm sorry you got shot, but just stay out of the way. Don't stop me from getting my gas. You and I have to be so concerned about peace that we're willing to do things that others won't do, that we're willing to step up. Well, pastor, we had that Black Lives Matter thing, but it became all political. I can't support any of that. This isn't about political stuff, not conservative political stuff, not liberal political stuff. This is about the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read it to you again. From Matthew 5, 9, this is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. we got to work for it. we got to labor for it. we got to agonize. Pastor, I just don't feel, that's not the way I was raised. You were raised wrong. Start living the way Jesus is raising you and I. He's raising us up to be different, to be kingdom-minded, not earthly minded, to be heavenly focused, not earthly focused. We're not working for a political party or political person. We don't care about who was there, who's going to be there. That'll all sort itself out. But when you and I stand before Jesus Christ in the next few weeks, we're not, did I say that? We're not going to be able to say, oh, I I didn't understand. I'll start right now. I'll start right now, Lord. I can't, Lord, I, I, those people, they don't, it's always those people. Listen, this is about you as a person. This is about me as a person being obedient and just saying, Jesus, help me to do something different for the place that I live. We got to work for peace. That's what the Bible says. That's what the New Testament says. That's what Jesus Christ says. He says, agonize. You got to struggle for it. You got to labor, not the other. You're working on behalf of the other. When you're in the majority, you've got the blessing and the privilege of working on behalf of others, no matter what people think, because you're secure in your position. I was reading a book by missionary David Grant. And uh, we're going to try and get him in here next month, Sister Arzu's helping me. He just wrote a new book, and uh, it's his life story. And when we first went to India, uh, missionary Mark Buntain took him to meet somebody that you all have heard of, Mother Teresa. Back in the early days, she was Sister Teresa, and she lived there for many years, worked in Calcutta, but wasn't having an impact until she gave up everything and went and lived with the Indians. And what she discovered was there were millions of them dying and nobody honored those who were sick and dying. She didn't didn't set out to do a home for people to get well or to minister. She set out to build a house for the dying because she felt that every one of them deserved dignity as they prepared for eternity. People laughed at her, made fun of her. The Indians rejected her. Most Christians didn't want anything to do with her because of how dirty the people were that she lived with, how disease-filled. But she changed a nation. We've got to work for peace. She was secure in who she was in Jesus. She knew she could, just like him, leave it all. She didn't need the accolades of others. She could walk away from all of that because she had security in who she was in Jesus. Jesus was able to leave the glory of heaven. He was able to lay aside his eternal kingly trappings because he was secure in all of that. I'm just going for a little bit. I'll be right back. All right, here's the third and final thing. We've got to get to a picnic, amen? Come on. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Thank you, Brother Dave. Man, that was, I could have said 10 million words and nothing had the power of that. Boy, how many of you are glad you came to church today? Huh? Has it been worth the ticket price? Man, if you haven't tithed yet, you've got to do it before you get out of here. Glory to God. 2 John, oh, I'm sorry, 2 Peter. And look at 2.10. 2 Peter 2.10. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading 2, right? Yeah, I'm right. I'm right. Am I where I want to be? Yeah, sorry. Uh, and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant. This is not what I want. I think I want 10. Does does that have the word? Come on, I looked all these up twice, but I had to retype it this morning. Hold on. I hate when I do this, but let me back up here and see if this is where I was at here. Huh. I know that's it. Oh, come on, Doug. What 
did you do? 1, 10, and 11? Ah. You know the two's right beside the one on the typewriter? <laughs> Go to chapter 1. I'm sorry. I was so worried that I would mess up these other verses that I didn't get the right thing here for you. 2 Peter 1, 10. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard. There's our word. Work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. What? Work hard to prove that you really are among those God has. I don't have to work to, to get to be. What? Do I have to prove that I'm saved? I don't have to prove anything. Satan's trying to get me to prove stuff. I can just do anything I want. I'm, Jesus died for me. He loves me. God loves me no matter what. It hurts my feelings when I read these kinds of things. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove. Number one, we work for profit. He has called us to work with our hands, to build businesses, to work for businesses, to love our job as much as we love the Lord and do it unto him so that we can give generously. We work for peace. Because as we pursue peace and a holy life, others see it, and there's peace in our land. And then finally, we work for proof. Yes, we do. You can deny it. You can reject it. You can say that's bad theology. You can say whatever you want. But I'm telling you, you're misled and misguided because the Bible says that you and I are to work hard to prove that we really are among those God has called and chosen. you got to prove it. You have to, otherwise... Peter said, we will fall away. 2 John 8 and 9. 2 John verses 8 and 9 says this. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Oh boy. These two were good friends. They ministered together. They lived together as they traveled with Jesus. And now here's John saying the exact same thing. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full reward. Anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. What? Wow, how firm is that? But anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. Number three, we work for proof. Sorry. Now that doesn't mean that we're going out here and doing things to impress God. It means we're going out here and doing things to impress others. Now, if you're doing it to impress others and you don't have salvation, it's called hypocrisy and they'll see right through it. But if you have salvation and you're secure in your salvation, then you can go out and work hard to prove to people that you've got what you say you've got. Hallelujah. Come on, you, you and I know this. The Spirit bears witness with it. This is God's Word. Now, I don't know what that looks like all the time. I don't know what it feels like, but I know that the Lord will help us. See, this isn't the thing where we just get to say, well, I, I went up to the front of the church one time, I signed a card, and, and that's it. Everything's great. No, that's not how it works. How it works is we grow in our relationship. And John said, if you don't have that relationship, you don't have it. But if you do, you get all the benefits. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And when the pastor rolls in and says, we're only seven and a half years away from the... Holy smokes here today. What is going on? We're only seven and a half years away from, from the 2,000 year anniversary of Calvary's cross, the resurrection from the dead, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He ascended to give gifts unto men. I think that's a pretty big deal, don't you? That we are just seven and a half years away from that big day. We may not be here for that big day. I hope we're not. Glory to God. But you and I can be telling others there's a day coming. There is a big day. It's not a Kmart blue light special it's way beyond that this is a big big day this isn't an all in by Amazon or uh, what's their day a day of buying everything on Amazon they tell you to all oh, get ready and buy everything this is much much different this is Jesus Christ the king of glory and you and I are working for him come on stand with me this morning we gotta get out of here praise God some of you, it's almost football season. You're getting ready for that. Or I guess high school's already started, huh? It's all in the paper. Some of you are back to school. I didn't come here today to terrorize you. <laughs> Feels like that, though, doesn't it? <laughs> 
I came here today to encourage you. Listen, Jesus could tarry a hundred years. I don't know. It's the, the day and the hour isn't up to me. But what I do know is we feel the excitement, the anticipation, because we're believers. We're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We understand that we're working for profit. What a blessing. That it, God's okay with us working. Listen, if you just got a pay raise, you know, the government, remember when the government was going to give us $15 an hour in 2028 or something? Isn't it funny how people are being paid $15 an hour right now? The government was going to fix everything. Of course, you can't buy two before until you've worked for 138 hours, but at least you're making 15 bucks an hour. We get to work for profit, but it's also our privilege to work for peace. It's easy for us to say the kind of experience that Brother Dave had happens over there or somewhere else, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, not just him or anybody else here that's a racial minority. I'm telling you. One of the cool things about bringing Sister Arzu onto our staff is that she's international. She's also going to be a racial minority in our church. Maybe not for long, but that helps us. It helps us because we're working for peace. Now listen, I'm not interested in racial peace. I'm interested, like Brother Dave, in a spiritual peace that produces racial peace. I can't divorce those two. He can't, he won't either. He will not. I know that. I will not. We work for racial peace out of a mindset, a spirit set of working for people to meet Jesus. That's, that's all we know. We live, breathe that. And then Jesus also gives us a privilege of working for proof. When you do something, he said, you know how hard it is to work for proof? When you offer somebody a cup of cold water in my name. It's that easy? <laughs> yeah, it's that easy. See, the bar's not set very high, is it? But in this world, boy, it's so easy to get our attention on everything going on around us, all the strife, all the financial issues, the virus. Right there where you are today, I want you to think about the things of the Lord. I want you to ask yourself this question. Not am I working for peace, but Jesus, how can my brother or sister today, how can they work for peace? What is it that they can do to be working for peace? And as that comes into their mind right now, maybe it's somebody at work, maybe it's somebody in the family, that they can show peace to them. It might not even be a racial issue, Lord. I use that today as an example. Maybe it's somebody in the family that it's just been difficult. They're just a difficult person or personality. But my brother or sister right now is being unctioned, anointed by the Holy Spirit to be the one that takes the step towards peace. Remind us, Lord, without somebody initiating, without somebody walking towards peace, peace will never come. You've called us to that. We thank you for it today. Hallelujah. Now what I want us to do this morning is just join in. Sister Pam's going to lead us in a closing song of, of worship. And I just want you to let all what God's done in this place today wash over you. And then we're going to just be together this afternoon. We're going to hug each other if, if we feel comfortable. Uh, we're going to be outside and distanced, but we're just going to be with each other. Because I'm telling you, we're in a time when things are difficult. We need each other. Amen. Come on, let's worship the Lord for a moment this morning before we leave. Lord, we're going to work for peace this week. We're going to do it. We're going to find a situation and we're going to work for peace. No matter what the people around us think, no matter what our family or our friends, we're going to begin to live out the word of the living God. Praise God. Chaplain Paul, would you come this morning and close us out in prayer? Listen, we're going to pray for the food and drink at the picnic so that when you get up there, you can just...
You say, I know you're famished and you haven't eaten in forever. But we also want to be able to just get up there at your own pace and um, go ahead and partake. I think Pastor Adam's probably already up there. I know a lot of other folks are getting everything ready. If you, this is your first Sunday here or your 400,000th Sunday, you can come to the picnic today. There will be some opportunities for games, we think. I think there's corn toss, maybe some other things. Hopefully lots of good food. And Chaplain Paul is going to pray a blessing over all that. Gang, I love you to pieces today. I hope Jesus comes this week. Amen. Before I close in prayer, after we just heard an amazing sermon on work, I just want to share briefly a statistics that Pastor David Zeiler, our director at the mission, talks about a lot. Today, 22,000 children will die of starv starvation in this world. And all of us in this church make up 80% of wealthiest America. If you are very close to a, arriving or achieving at having a $10 bill in your hand today, or you have a half a cup of clean cold milk in your refrigerator, you are in the 80% of wealth. And I think in America and in North America and in Canada too, we often think, well, wealthy is only the millionaire. Well, wealthy is only the one that has the half million dollar home. We are blessed. Yes, we, are. we are a blessed, rich people. Be thankful and grateful today for work and for this awesome sermon and the way that the Holy Spirit met us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word today that is going to challenge us. And as Pastor said, peruse on it, chew on it. Thank God for your work. Thank God that we can be peacemakers even in secular work and allow that work to be our ministry as we pray for our directors, our co-laborers, our colleagues, the other employees, those we submit to. It's a ministry and can be more of a ministry if we allow it to be that. Father, we thank you so much for our health today. We thank you so much for our salvation today. We thank you for our friends and families in this very church house. And we thank you that through administrative ministry transitions in this church house, you're going to bless those leaving their ministry post, and you're going to provide new ministers in those posts. You're always faithful that way. Today, we thank you for the Pavilion Labor Day picnic. Holy Spirit, be there amongst us. Be there as we share and fellowship and break bread together. Thank you for the provision of this rich picnic. And Lord, we know that you're going to encourage and exhort and admonish us as we're sitting amongst those tables because the Holy Spirit's going to be present. In Jesus' precious, holy, matchless name, this morning we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, and all the holy adoration. Amen. Oh my